Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tricia Castranio and I am the GEH program manager here at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. I have a couple things I want to tell you about and then we'll get started. Um, if you're having any technical issues, please use the chat box and Nathan and I will do our best to help you. Um, we have a great lineup today and a lot of good talks, so I'm really excited to see all your questions. Please put those in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll do our best to compile those and, and get everybody's questions answered. If you uh, see a question there while you're posting yours that you really like to hear answered also, if you give us a thumbs up, it'll raise the priority level of that question and we'll make sure we get to it. Um, if we don't get to your question, uh, please feel free to contact our speakers directly. I will have the contact information on the last slide after, at the end, towards the end of the event. And finally, um, this webinar is being recorded. So let me introduce now um, our host, Dr. John Balbus. He is the Senior Advisor for Public Health to the Office of the Director here at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. He is the Director of the Global Environmental Health Program and the Director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Environmental Health Sciences. John, take it away. Great, well, thank you very much, Tricia, and thanks to all of you who are online, all 136 right now, uh, for joining us today for the fifth in our series of seminars on climate, environment, and health. Today, we will be talking about ensuring equitable responses to climate-related disasters during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and um, it is my uh, great pleasure to be able to introduce our moderator for today. Let me just say, uh, you will be hearing, uh, again, this is the fifth in our series. This is a seminar series that uh, our leadership at NIEHS has asked our Global Environmental Health Program to produce. And um, our, our next month's um, seminar will be held on October 21st at 11 a.m. We'll be talking about climate change in children's health. So keep an eye out for that. But now let me introduce our moderator for today. Um, our moderator is uh, a well-known health policy leader, practitioner, and administrator um, in the United States and globally, Dr. Georges Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin is the executive director of the American Public Health Association, which is the nation's oldest and largest organization of public health professionals. Dr. Benjamin um, is a former secretary of health for the state of Maryland. He is an emergency room physician. He is board certified in internal medicine and has extensive experience at the intersection of emergency response and public health. Um, Dr. Benjamin is uh, not only a fellow of the National Academy of Medicine, but also the National Academy of Public Administration and is um, celebrated by both the American College of Physicians and the American College of Emergency Physicians. With that, Dr. Benjamin, let me turn it over to you and to hear from you and, and to have you uh, help moderate in our panel for today. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, this is um, looking forward to doing this. Let me just um, start by hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so let, let me just talk a bit about COVID to start with. Obviously, everyone's familiar with this picture of this virus and talk a little bit about the status of it and some of the public health strategies and try to put them in the context of disaster preparedness um, as we go through. Um, recognizing that we do have clearly a, a, a serious outbreak that's all over the world. We're, we're over 7 million cases in the United States, um, um, over 200,000 deaths. And actually, um, um, this, this continues to be um, a, a very significant outbreak worldwide. Um, I like to talk about the fact there, there are probably three of these. There's an infectious disease outbreak. There's an amazing amount of misinformation and disinformation. Um, and an epidemic, epidemic of fear for all the variety of reasons that you see there. Let me just point out that during a disaster, um, all of these issues become magnified. Uh, obviously, uh, adding an infectious disease during the middle of a disaster, particularly a big environmental disaster, um, really makes that disaster response um, very difficult. Um, the currency around emergency response is good situational awareness and good information. So um, having misinformation and disinformation during disaster um, truly undermines um, uh, the ability to have a, 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 a responsible response um, to whether or not it's a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake um, or uh, wildfires. All of these um, are climate driven um, issues. And, and obviously anytime something bad happens to you, people are afraid 
Um, so this is a, a significant issue that we have to think about. Um, as you know, this, um, this virus is part of a family of coronaviruses. Um, the one we're worried about right now is SARS-CoV-2. Um, but it is important that this family ranges from everything from a coronavirus that causes the common colds to MERS, which is a coronavirus that you get from camels, which is not very infectious, but is very lethal. Um, so far, this disease has resulted in um, an outbreak that, on average, um, every person who's infected can infect two other people. Of course, there are super spreaders that can infect multiple people. Um, I want to focus on the fact that although 80% of the folks have mild symptoms, um, about the 20% of the people get very, very severely ill. And all of these folks tend to have a disease complex that seems to have clinical symptoms for months and months. So even if you have mild symptoms, you're, you're likely to have some ongoing medical problems for some time to come. Um, fatality rates somewhere between one and a half and three and a half, um, depending on um, which population you're looking at. And this disease causes lots of complications, um, strokes, clots. Um, it's um, defined by a significant immune dysfunction that people have. Um, and the community transmission can be as much as 40% uh, of the people can transmit this disease asymptomatically. That, that has enormous implications behind disaster preparedness because, um, um, you know, when you're having symptomatic people, you can generally isolate them um, um, from a, a population that you're trying to, to, to move away in a disaster. That's obviously very, very difficult when for up to 40% of the people um, don't have any symptoms at all. We know that it's impacting communities in a desperate manner. Um, so Native American, African American, Latino, and even Asian Pacific Islanders um, are disproportionately impacted when compared to non-Hispanic whites. Now, I, I just remind you that this is also the pattern um, in many ways that we see with, um, with climate change and the fact that um, communities of color, um, lower income communities and underserved communities tend to be disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, and so when one of these events happens, such as we just saw in the, uh, the coast, um, in the Gulf Coast states of Texas and Louisiana uh, and Florida, uh, those communities got a double hit from not only COVID, but they also get um, the hit from the hurricanes that they've recently seen. Uh, in this case, of course, they had a lot of rain, not as much wind damage as we um, have, um, have seen in the past, but this is a significant in issue. Um, and I'm going to talk about California a little later and the wildfire. Now, we know that some of the disparities um, that we're seeing from this coronavirus are due to exposure, the fact that people have public facing jobs. Also, there was a fair amount of delaying sheltering in place due to misinformation early on in the, in the disease outbreak. Uh, susceptibility because of the prevalence of chronic diseases. I also want to point out these, this disparity in chronic diseases for more heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease are exactly the same diseases, particularly lung disease and heart disease that we see with climate sensitive con conditions. So again, there's an enormous overlap between these two populations. Uh, and then the issue that for, at least for COVID, the social determinants of health, the fact, the lack of paid sick leave, the fact that people live in housing situations with large families, multi-generational families in some situations, pro prohibit them from being to effectively isolate and quarantine. And then when you have to um, um, move these folks into a conjugate setting because of a disaster, um, that also exacerbates the problem that we're seeing um, when you have these two um, co-occurring disasters, both COVID um, and events from climate change at the same time. Um, we know that this disease is um, um, shared through um, droplet spread through airborne viruses. There's also um, some degree of aerosolization. We're not quite sure of its impact um, on infection. Um, but it's important. And then the fomite transformation when you're from an infected surface. So you infect your hand, you touch a surface, and then someone comes behind you and touches that surface, whether it's a desk or a doorknob 
uh, or some other inanimate object. Um, Right now, we're not seeing a lot of fulmite transmission, um, trans but we will in the future um, as we continue to leave our homes. Um, this also has a profound implication behind uh, uh, managing disasters because, of course, um, people are again put in, into conjugate settings, and um, anyone's seen the shelters that we, we move people to in a disaster, they're not the ideal place for hand washing or physical distancing um, and wearing a mask uh, continues to be a challenge no matter where we are, even though it's very important. Um, we know that prevention right now is the key because the tools we have are wearing a mask, washing our hands and physically distancing um, and selective closure of large events. Again, this becomes a real challenge when you have to move a lot of people. Um, it also becomes a big issue because we try and encourage people to keep their windows open um, and that becomes a challenge when you have um, wildfires and air that is not really safe to breathe. Um, you have to close the windows and that can also perpetuate a disease like this. Um, this is one of my favorite photos of, um, of a sneezing cough and you can see obviously uh, lots of particles of different sizes get expelled when you cough or sneeze, uh, but it also occurs when you sing or talk. So there are lots of masks. The gold standard mask is the N95 mask, which is really worn tight um, over the face. Um, it's an important mask um, to wear. The um, surgical mask um, is, is a lot looser around. And of course, if aerosolization is important, you can really breathe around that mask. Um, and of course, in the cotton mask um, is, is, uh, is also very important um, and, and very useful. It turns out that the science around wearing these masks um, have evolved and we've learned a lot more about the importance of wearing a mask. And it turns out wearing a mask can reduce up to 80 to 90 percent of the exposure. So if I wear a mask, I'm protecting you. If you wear a mask, you're protecting me. Um, now the challenge we have, of course, in wearing masks um, in an environment where um, it's tough to breathe um, because of the heat um, and excess heat that we're seeing from climate change or from the um, um, from wildfires remains a big problem. Um, and then from a, um, um, the stigma issue, I just continue to remind people that uh, um, we've had African Americans and, and, and Latinx individuals in particular um, um, stigmatized because of wearing a mask. Um, we've also had people stigmatized, particularly Asian Americans, uh, about who they are uh, in this outbreak and treated badly. Um, but this mask issue is very important. There are a lot of people that don't want to wear a mask simply because they're, con they're concerned that they will be viewed as more threatening um, than they should be viewed. Um, and as, as we know, there's a, there's a, we politicize it such that there's significant anti-mask uh, resistance. Um, and again, the science is, is real clear. Even though early on, um, we did not really know that um, um, the importance of wearing masks, we now know how important wearing a mask is. Um, and if one doesn't believe that, this is an interesting graph from the folks in Kansas, uh, the Kansas health officer where they have mandated masks. Um, in those counties in the red where um, mask mandates have been met, have been required, um, there's a dramatic reduction in COVID um, cases um, compared to the blue uh, counties in, in Kansas where there are not. And so that's a, a real life example of the value of wearing a mask. All, all other things being equal. Um, we all know that hand washing works. It's, it's, it's clearly an important part of prevention. Um, and then the physical distancing part, this is 1918. Um, I encourage people to be more like St. Louis than Philadelphia. Philadelphia was late in social distancing. The health officer in fact was resistant to it. And you can see there, they had a, a large um, increase in death cases. Um, and um, St. Louis obviously had a lower incidents because they were early to social distance as part of their, um, their response in 1918. And of course, in the United States, we have tried to emulate that. Every school child knows the term flattening the curve. Um, the goal was, of course, to protect our, both our health system, rebuild our public health system so we could respond. Um, we've had mixed results in this over, over the time period of this outbreak. Um, but basically, public health works, testing, isolation, um, and quarantining is important. Um, um, and we've had better therapeutics. Um, 
now that we know. We've learned a lot about how to manage this outbreak a lot better, how to manage the airway. We've got better, um, some early um, antiviral agents that are still undergoing randomized controlled trials. So far, those antiviral agents don't cure the disease, but they, they shorten the course of the disease um, and to address some of the immunologic problems that we're seeing, steroids, um, monoclonal antibodies, and antibody-rich plasma uh, are examples. Um, everybody's waiting for us to find out when we're going to have a vaccine. I think most of us think that the studies are going in the right direction, probably not until the first part of the year where we actually see um, an abundance of any safe, effective vaccines. But again, that remains to be seen. Um, and just remind you that once we get a vaccine, um, there are significant issues around distribution of that vaccine. It may require two shots. And right now it looks like it requires extreme cold storage um, before utilization of the vaccine. And so most doctor's offices do not have a, um, um, a refrigerator or a freezer that can store things at um, uh, 100 uh, degrees minus uh, Fahrenheit. So let me just talk a bit about um, the issues around climate change. I think most of us in the environmental world have seen this is very important um, slide that CDC put together about the impact of climate change on human health and recognizing that um, um, there are lots of things that are happening now that get exacerbated uh, in climate change, including air pollution, changes in, in the vector uh, ecology. I would argue that that's probably, um, we can probably crosswalk some of the exposure of um, and the emergence of COVID-19 um, to some of these changes that we're seeing um, in um, the community, as well as the fact that we humans are now encroaching on parts of the community um, and um, um, parts of the ecosystem that uh, are exacerbating our exposure to some of these infectious diseases. Uh, we also know that these um, oppressive heat um, uh, in our community, um, and the changes in the environment has increased the number of allergens. Uh, these allergens are, cause, are causing more, more allergy, allergenic attacks, more asthma attacks, more attacks of people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, uh, and then the whole issues around forced migration, um, the rainstorms we're seeing, the, the excessive rainstorms, which are polluting um, the waters um, in which we, we drink and we bathe and are causing surreal, surreal significant issues in terms of our ability to respond effectively. And they have some impact on this uh, COVID-19 outbreak um, because um, we're, we're now known that uh, uh, these severe storms that we're seeing um, have caused just significant um, uh, challenges in terms of managing and more disaster response. And we should expect more of these um, in an increasing um, array over the next several years. Um, I remind folks that Los Angeles had a smoggy pass and um, um, we um, really put in place the Clean Air Act as a way of trying to make a difference. And today um, the clean air um, does make a difference. And so the regulatory environment that we're in has, has really helped us. Um, the fact that um, San Francisco um, has had those terrible, um, the Northern California trouble wildfires. I remember um, having a webinar with folks and they were telling me about the orange colored skies looking out their windows. Um, in addition, we have substantial problems um, with people in air quality in, in, in California right now. And now throughout the Western part of the United States, we're having um, these wildfires due to climate change. Um, and again, the dual epidemics of climate change and COVID-19 um, are causing significant problems um, with the health and well-being of the, our communities. Uh, and then even though we've made some progress, um, we still have a ways to go in terms of, of making sure the air is, is safe to breathe. Um, finally, we now are having a, a degree of emerging evidence that um, people with um, climate sensitive conditions are also more likely to get sicker should they get infected with COVID-19. Um, and just point that out that that's a significant problem um, as we go forward. So with that, I'll stop. And um, maybe I can take a few questions before we go to the panel. Great, thank you so much, Georges. We have just a couple of questions that have come in. Um, and 
maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a question and, and try to put it a little bit in, in, in the context of what we'll be talking about, which is, you know, the, the, how do we manage climate related disasters and the need for people to evacuate during the pandemic? Um, there's, there, there's a, and the question is kind of about fomites and how do fomites work? The, the specific question was, you know, if the virus has to get into your airway, what does it matter if it gets on your hands? How does it get from your hands into your body? Um, and maybe, Georges, you can expand then about what this, what the implications of fomites are for, you know, shelters and people who have to go into shelters. So one of the things um, we know is that this virus remains active for some period of time, um, um, at least hours. And so how do you, how do you infect it? Um, you um, touch your mouth, you're infected, you're spewing virus, you cough or touch your mouth, <clears throat> and then you touch object, whether it's a doorknob or a table, um, and then someone comes behind you and touches the button on the elevator or turns the doorknob. And then once they've got it on their hands, they then touch their mouth or their nose. And if anyone just thinks about what you do every day, um, most of us frequently are touching our face, we're touching our nose, we're touching our eyes. So we're very, very likely to um, um, contaminate our, um, our nasal pharyngeal airway um, through that process. Um, so that, that's how a fulmite transmission certainly occurs. Uh, again, the fact that we are um, not often, you know, not out of our homes as much, and the fact that this virus is rapidly deactivated by common household cleaners, so that, frankly, good cleaning results in a much more reduced um, risk of exposure from the fulmite um, method of exposure. But it's still possible. Great. And when you're in a in, when you're in a conjugate setting um, of of a big hall where everybody's close to one another and touching everything, and um, I can assure you that unlike in my office, where we have a cleaning crew that not only comes in every night and cleans, but they clean a couple times during the day, you don't have that really set up in, in many of the, the shelters in which people go to. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, we, we had a, 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 a um, workshop at the National Academy and I was very struck by what they described as the pig pen effect, which is that if there's fomites and viruses and particles on the ground that just walking around on that. So if you imagine a hurricane shelter and if somebody is spreading virus, just the act of walking can resuspend that. You had that in one of your slides. So it's a- I did, and, and that's think a big about. issue because you know, right now there's a big debate in the public health community about the role of aerosolization. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course the, the corollary to that is re-aerosolization or resuspension um, right. when people walk around if the virus is around on the floor or on top, top of things. Great, thank you. We have some. We have some basic questions here on um, on 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 some of the details of COVID. But I think maybe Georges, why don't we go on to the panel? Because I think some of these questions will be good um, to have our panelists discuss as well. So we'll hold these questions and bring them up when we get to the longer Q and A. We'll have quite a bit of time for that. Okay. And so thank you very much, folks. We'll move on to the panel. And we're gonna, we have three wonderful panelists for you uh, today. Um, Dr. Janelle Rios, uh, Dr. Patricia Solis, uh, Dr. Nicole Hernandez-Hammer. Um, and um, we're gonna have each of them um, give us a, a short, brief presentation, um, and then we'll have some conversation. Um, so Dr. Rios. Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm pulling up my slide set right now. And hang on, share. And I'm guessing you all can see that now. Let me put it in power in presentation mode. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Janelle Rios. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is quite an honor for me because um, uh, I normally work in the realm of health and safety and environmental health. Uh, so this is a little bit outside my lane, but I think it's really important to cross train and, and talk about these issues together. 
uh, so that we can get out of our, our siloed approach. Well, I have a friend who says siloed isn't really siloed. They're cylinders of excellence. But, um, let, you know, I think that we should share what's inside of our cylinders. And so that's my, my hope for today. Um, I'm a faculty associate at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. And that'll become more important uh, during the presentation. And I think that um, as I speak, I, I may end up raising more questions and providing answers, but we'll, we'll see. So um, in advance to this particular uh, presentation, uh, we were talking with Dr. Gabas and Dr. Benjamin, what, what is an equitable response and why does that matter? Um, and I thought, well, what do we mean by an equitable response? And, and what do we even mean by equitable? And, and, and these are concepts that weren't, I never learned, you know, I, I studied air and water and the very glamorous waste. Um, I was an environmental investigator for the state of Texas for 10 years and my specialty was solid waste. Not that glamorous. But um, so these were things that were not in my, my library uh, inside my head. So, um, so I thought I needed to look these things up and really understand what we mean. So um, let's talk about equality. Equality truly focuses on the input. So here in this graphic, and I'm not sure if you can see my, my cursor, but um, input is we give everybody an equal amount. And we, we, that's the priority. We don't really prioritize the output in this case. But in, with equity, we truly prioritize the output and what, what do we get? What's the benefit rather than the input? So here you can see that the input varies um, and the output, and I would, I would say this is an output, not an outcome. So the output is that everybody reaches the fruit. Um, additionally, uh, if you look up equity, what does that mean? There's impartiality, there's fairness, there's justice, and these, these concepts truly are outside of my lane. But for completeness sake, I thought that I would include them here. Um, but what I am very familiar with, very, very familiar with, is Hurricane Harvey. As I said, I have lived in the Houston area for a while. Uh, I've been through Hurricane Ike. Oh, that was, that was a bad one. Um, I was without power for 13 days and it was hot, it's Houston, it's very hot, even in September. Um, Tropical Storm Allison, uh, well, a whole bunch of them. Rita, so Hurricane Harvey, ooh, Hurricane Harvey was quite the monster. Um, so Houston is not a lovely city, but it's a fun city, um, and it's a big city with big city amenities, um, and I, I love being in the city. Um, Early in the summer of 2017, my husband and I, this is us, uh, closed on a house in Bel Air, which is a little city inside of Houston. Lovely house, early in the summer of 2017. Um, I took my time in remodeling the kitchen, mostly because I couldn't make some decisions um, that ended up being a good thing. So we lived in another house about a mile away a big house that had a garage apartment. Um, it, was, it was lovely. And so I would come to this new house and, and I would sit in the floor and I'd contemplate, what do I want to do with the kitchen? Well, then comes Hurricane Harvey. And this is what it did to the city of Houston and all of Southeast Texas, um, East, Southeast Texas, East, Northeast Texas, you know, into Louisiana. Harvey was truly a gigantic monster. Um, this is what it did to our dream house. Uh, we canoed actually from the old house, again, a mile away to this house, and I was in disbelief. I, as I saw this, as we, we, we were paddling, we saw this, I thought, that's not possible. Um, and I, I wasn't even upset or angry or scared or worried. I was like, this is not happening. And maybe, and I, maybe the water didn't really get inside of the house. Well, it did. <laughs> so this is the living room of our house, uh, of the new house, beautiful house with beautiful wood floors. Um, and <clears throat> the waste that came from our house was immense. The waste that came from everybody's homes was immense. So this picture in the middle here, this is some of our waste from our house. 
This is down the street and you could see the waves being piled up everywhere up and down the street. Um, at this time, uh, the city of Houston had two gigantic mega shelters um, in our big uh, spaces at the George R. Brown Convention Center. <clears throat> and it, these were gigantic mega centers that had services provided inside uh, such as hair cutting and, and some health services. Uh, when I was in the George R. Brown one day, I met a man who said he did not know he had diabetes, but it was the health services inside of the shelter that told him that he had diabetes and he needed to take care of it. So, and this is a man who was in a wheelchair and he thought, you know, as the floodwaters rose in his apartment, he thought he was just gonna drown there until he was rescued. So this is my experience and, and I'd like to tell you that this is what I felt during Hurricane Harvey. First, disbelief, like this couldn't possibly be happening, no way. And then I felt really badly for the people who live in one-story um, houses and how the, the water rose so fast and stayed for so long and it was so horrible. I felt really badly uh, for them. So I had a great deal of empathy. I was lucky, so I felt grateful. I had still my other house that I had not put on the market and it did not flood, though it got really close, uh, too close for comfort, but it was really close. Um, I felt feelings of annoyance. I, I was annoyed that I had to deal with the insurance company, had to deal with contractors who we hired to, to clean out the house and had to deal with the insurance adjuster who was a very creepy guy. <laughs> I, yes, creepy guy. I'm happy to talk offline about that. Um, I was frustrated that the reconstruction took so long. It took a little over two years in my case. Yet I was very grateful of what the result was. And, and right now I am webcasting to you from this little window um, off the side that it was the dining room, but I turned it into a makeshift office during COVID. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be in this house uh, right now. So this was my experience. It wasn't bad. My experience, these are the emotions I felt. And none of them were horrible emotions at all. So let me tell you about somebody else, Marina. Marina is um, in her mid seventies. She was the housekeeping staff. So I work at the School of Public Health building during non COVID times. It's a 10 story building with a basement and basements are few and far between in Houston. Um, so at the time in 2017, I was working <clears throat> uh, on the second floor and Marina was tasked every evening to clean the second floor. Uh, housekeeping staff, wonderful lady, doesn't speak English, um, and I work at night often, so I would see the housekeeping staff, and it gave me a chance to, to get to know them, and their names, and their children, and I learned all about them, and I, I knew that she lived in a mobile home. I knew that she lived near the North Freeway in, in White Oak Bayou, and this little map kind of shows you roughly where that is. Um, it, and the photo is just a stock photo I found on the internet um, of, of how, this is a little further north on 45, but this is the freeway here on the left. It was, it was completely underwater and, and people were uh, in boats rescuing folks. Well, Ma Marina, the housekeeper, teeny tiny woman, teeny, very, very petite, very thin, very mighty. This woman would strap on one of those uh, vacuum cleaner backpacks and vacuum the entire second floor amazed me. Well, she was afraid of water. Um, and that night when the hurricane hit, she had to be rescued um, by a boat uh, at night. The water was rising, rising, um, and she refused to leave her mobile home. Um, even though her husband said, look, the, the, the supports to the mobile home, they could fail and the mobile home could be washed away. Um, she said if that was God's will, she was just going to stay there and she would die uh, because she was so afraid to step into the boat. Well, they, she was forced into the boat. Um, and then she ended up spending the rest of the night under a metal roof at, at a, an elementary school that was nearby um, with other people. Some of those other people were not the best of character. Um, she said it was horrible um, that there was a dog that bit a child. That, but nobody said anything. Everybody just crouched there 
all together. And can you imagine that was during COVID um, and how awful it was. And she was in the morning trucked with some volunteer had taken her family um, off to a shelter, but the shelter was full. Uh, she had to walk to another shelter. She was traumatized, absolutely traumatized. And she told me the story. She collapses and is crying as she's telling me her story. Um, so the feelings that she felt truly were terror. She had no shelter. I mean, literally no shelter. Um, she was out in the elements. She had a loss of control of, of what was happening to her body, to, to her situation. She was completely helpless. And, and that was her experience. Um, I also have a friend. So this is my third experience I'm going to share with you guys. And I promise I'm going to be quick. Um, my friend, Anne. Anne uh, has a four-year degree in microbiology. She works as a lab tech at one of the very large hospitals here in the Texas Medical Center. Um, when the hurricane hit, uh, she was stranded for two nights, 18 inches of water in her home. Now, Anne is not good at housekeeping. Um, one of my closest friends, I can say this. Um, so she has a mess, but that mess with 18 inches of water was awful, awful. So I ended up hiring people to clean my house. I volunteered at her house um, to clean up and it was awful because some sewage actually had gotten into her home. Uh, she was, she on a good day is easily overwhelmed. Um, but at a time like this, she was incredibly overwhelmed and didn't know where to start. So I said, get your clothes. We're going to wash all of your clothes. We're going to move you into the garage apartment. So her, her husband, and her dog came to live in our garage apartment. They stayed there for about seven months. And then we would go back to her house and inventory everything. Um, you know, slowly but surely, we inventoried things and we put everything out on the street that wasn't salvageable. Um, she, she couldn't deal with the um, remodeling. So what she did was she sold the house to an investor. And she moved out of state thinking she will never ever go through one of these storms again. Um, <clears throat> so her feelings afterwards, she had a loss of control. She had severe property damage and she was so overwhelmed and so frustrated and so exhausted. So, and that was Anne with a four year degree. So, so what is an equitable response? For Marina, the housekeeper, she was severely traumatized but when she went back to the mobile home, it wasn't damaged at all. Um, and she, she was relieved, but her, her daughter who lived three mobile homes down had damage to her home. So it wasn't like, you know, she got off scot-free, but she had severe trauma because she, she had some severe fear. Um, my friend Anne was also traumatized, but I would, I would say to a lesser extent, you know, her trauma resulted in her inability to make decisions, but she did have some severe home damage. And me, I, you know, I had flood insurance. I had a, lucky me, I had a whole nother house. I mean, how many people can say that? So I did not feel any trauma at all, um, even though we did experience some severe damage. Um, so my, my question to this group, and I really welcome your commentary is, do we want to focus on the inputs, making sure everybody has an equal piece of the pie in, in the case of a disaster? Or do we want to focus on the outputs that everybody can get back to where that they're in, they're in, they are able to function well? Um, so what do we want to consider in our response? Do we want to consider income? So I, I make good money. Um, I have a doctoral degree, a master's degree. I, I make good money. My husband also has a, a terminal degree, so he makes great money. We are, we don't need help um, other than, you know, hey, way to go, or, you know, come buy me a glass of wine. That would be welcomed. Um, do, do we want to consider in our response the property value, the financial losses? Do we want to, because our losses were huge. Do we want to, oh, I see George's, um, health services, the need for them, mental health services, insurance status. Do you want to consider legacy policies? For example, this map that I'm showing you is from the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was started in the 30s and ended up leaving a legacy of redlining. And this is the map of Houston that is redlined. Um, 
And then I want to conclude by saying, what should we consider in our response? Um, and now everything is much more complicated with the COVID pan pandemic. So I welcome your commentary and I thank you very kindly for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rios. Um, I'd like to now go to um, Dr. Patricia Solis. She's the Executive Director of the Knowledge Exchange for Res Resilience at the Arizona State Uni University. Dr. Solis. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. What I'd like to ask is uh, what happens when a pandemic like COVID-19 crashes into a place that is already experiencing climate change disaster in the form of extreme heat. And uh, as Dr. Benjamin mentioned, we know that, you know, the pandemic effects are not going to be felt evenly by everyone everywhere and that the comorbidities and uh, exacerbating conditions will vary by place. As a geographer, we call this a uh, spatial heterogeneity and um, I would like to identify what are the local factors um, that are particularly confounding for different communities. And here in Arizona, one of those most important critical multiplying factors is extreme heat. But already, in fact, the number one fatal weather related hazard in the US historically for death is heat, not just heat waves, but chronic exposure to the effects of high temperatures. Uh, here in Maricopa County, um, last year, 2019, we hit an all-time record of heat-associated deaths, just shy of 200 people. Already for 2020, there have been 106 confirmed cases of heat-associated deaths, according to the Public Health Department, and another 234 are under investigation. Meanwhile, the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, res um, Morbidity rates by date of death actually coincide uh, precisely over these hottest summer months. So on the one hand, rising temperatures are clearly worrisome. And in fact, uh, you know, 2020, we've actually seen in Phoenix record 50 days over 110 degrees. Uh, it's the hottest year on record so far for maximum, but also overnight lows We've had 28 days with uh, the minimum temperature over 90 degrees. So we know that, you know, on the one hand, uh, that matters. But on the other hand, we also know that temperature alone does not explain or completely predict the number of heat associated deaths. Vulnerability absolutely matters. As it might surprise you that of all heat associated deaths, 35% of them actually occur indoors, inside of shelter, precisely where we are supposed to be weathering out the pandemic compared to other disasters where the idea is to leave your home, the shelter in place was a very important response for this pandemic, but it can be deadly in extreme heat. Why can't they keep cool? Well, in 16% um, uh, of the heat associated deaths, officials found that they had no AC. Of those that did, 60% didn't work. The units didn't work. 11% had no electricity. And 28% had functioning AC. They had electrical hookups, but it was just not turned on. Let that sink in for a second. That might be because Arizonans pay utility rates at 6% higher than the national average and uh, not paying your utility bill can also be grounds for eviction. Because of the pandemic though, the state does have moratoriums right now for both utility cutoffs and evictions. Uh, but those state bans end October 31st and it doesn't actually pay for the bills. So um, we were really curious in, in terms of the heat associated deaths, uh, you know, what, what are some of those factors that cross our county? And um, we teamed up with 80 different organizations who serve all the residents of Maricopa County. And they particularly serve residents who are need help paying utility bills. So we mapped out where that assistance was being distributed across the valley. Uh, we also mapped out where the indoor heat associated deaths occurred, and it was immediately clear the parts of our metro area are falling between the cracks. You can see there in Mesa right below this text box. Upon closer look, these are mobile home parks. Mobile home park dwellers are um, typically not um, 
the direct customers of the utilities, so they don't receive some of those uh, utility rate programming. Um, they are not eligible for the federal like heap dollars that might help them pay their AC bills because of their housing is just ineligible. Um, also, you know, they're not good candidates for the tree programs given the concrete. And so while 50%, I'm sorry, while 5% of our housing stock in Maricopa County is in manufactured housing, in 2019, 40% of the heat associated deaths occurred in trailer parks. Age is a factor just like for COVID and many elderly live alone in mobile homes. Um, overall, black and Native American Arizonans are disproportionately represented in the heat mortality statistics. And um, there are also trailer parks that uh, house immigrant families of color as we know that that is a statistical association with housing loss. Um, and finally in 2019, it was 37% of all the outdoor heat associated deaths occurred to individuals who are just without shelter. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, the widely used heat uh, vulnerability index does not include shelter explicitly or the lack of shelter as a vulnerability factor. And most emergency management plans do not reference chronic heat as an environmental hazard. Uh, when they do mention mobile homes, uh, it's usually in reference to flooding of all things. So we need to connect these dots, heat, health, housing. There are about 20 million Americans who live in mobile homes and uh, manufactured housing provides shelter for one in 10 households living below the poverty line. With rising temperatures across the US, the US um, I'd like to ask, are we doing enough to keep up with this? And then when you layer disaster upon disaster, extreme heat coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, we see some of the same communities experiencing these highest risk. And these threats are multiplied when you have to shelter in place and cannot keep that shelter cool. What do we do when those moratoriums expire and when the bills come due? At ASU, we are working with this, our stakeholders and um, faculty and students to try to build up some solutions, legal, built environment, technical, um, uh, regulatory solutions, and sort of a, a package because they've just been falling between the cracks and we think that we're at the forefront of this innovation, um, experiencing this, this heat here first. Uh, we'd like to share that with you as we learn more. Thank you. Dr. Benjamin, we can't hear you, you're muted. Thank you very much. I'd now like to bring Nicole Hernandez-Hammer. She is a community environmental scientist at U uh, UPROS, which is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Ms. Hammer. Hi, good morning, can you see my screen? We, yes, we can. place it in presentation mode, thank you. So good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Georges, and to John and Tricia and uh, NIH for having me here today. Um, some background on me. I'm originally from Guatemala. I grew up in Miami. I uh, was there during Hurricane Andrew. In fact, uh, we lost our home uh, then back in 1992 and experienced a lot of the, uh, the impacts uh, and, the, and the effects that Dr. Uh, Rios uh, so um, well described earlier today. That actually put me on the track to become a scientist. I'm a biologist. I work on climate change and environmental justice issues, specifically focused on the impacts of sea level rise and heat on frontline communities and communities of color. Um, many of the same communities that are already being disproportionately burdened by uh, the effects of COVID-19. So today I'll share uh, about my background, uh, the research that I've done, and that'll leave us at a point where we've laid a foundation to have a conversation about how communities that are disproportionately vulnerable to climate change are, are now having to um, grapple with the disproportional impacts of COVID. So I spent about 10 years in academia, and for most of that time, I worked on climate change research, looking at the impacts of sea level rise and storms on natural systems and urban infrastructure in Florida and some in the Gulf Coast. It was through that work that I began to put the pieces together on how disproportionately vulnerable communities of color are to sea level rise 
In particular, uh, at that time, I focused on Latino communities in my hometown of Miami. I wanted to focus research in that space, but more importantly, I felt an urgency to work on community-led initiatives to advance mitigation and adaptation policy in frontline communities. Through my work and the work of my colleagues, I was able to pinpoint vulnerability to sea level rise and heat at the block level, as you can see in that map, um, in Miami, and overlay that demographic information to begin to identify the places of highest vulnerability in Miami-Dade County. At that time, there wasn't a lot of adaptation or mitigation work happening um, in the communities that I was the most concerned about. But we knew that sea level rise related uh, flooding was happening and made communities more vulnerable to stronger storms that we were anticipating in the near future. This was over 10 years ago, so now we know that this is a reality. I made the decision to move from academia into advocacy and outreach work in order to better serve frontline communities. I joined the Environmental Defense Fund and then the Union of Concerned Scientists and started to partner with local community-based organizations that at the time were working on issues around jobs and affordable housing, but we started having conversations about climate change and vulnerability and they began to pivot their work into the climate change space. A lot of these organizations now are adding COVID to the list of issues that they're dealing with in frontline communities communities. I worked on translating climate change information into Spanish to create more accessibility for Spanish speakers. Then we went to the lowest lying blocks during the highest tides of the year and spoke with residents, documented their stories, and worked with residents that were most affected by what we call sunny day flooding. That's flooding that is happening in low-lying areas as a direct result of sea level rise. Um, the sea level rise that's happened over the last 50 years. So you can see in the lower picture, there's a lady holding a piece of paper. On that piece of paper, it's kind of hard to read, but she has the date and her address. Uh, her name is uh, Maria Escobar, and she lives in that house right behind her. This was during a sunny day, during the highest tides of the year, which generally in Florida and in Miami happen in the fall. And the garbage trucks wouldn't come down her street because that's salt water and it would ruin the trucks. So they, she have to put garbage bags around her legs and watch the and, and, and drag the garbage cans down the street in order to have garbage picked up. Um, and this wasn't related to, as I said, a storm or any other event. This is just the new normal for many low lying places in Miami, um, but also in Louisiana and in other coastal um, cities across the country. This kind of flooding blocks streets, floods homes, floods cars, and is a health hazard. Some of my colleagues uh, tested this water and found very high levels of E. coli, among other things. Um, so we developed workshops and town hall meetings with elected officials, and all of these efforts led to local policy changes, inclu including increased uh, funding for adaptation and mitigation efforts in frontline communities. We undertook similar efforts in communities that were disproportionately vulnerable to heat and held community events during the hottest weeks of the year in local cooling centers in partnership with the American Red Cross. I worked with the Union of Concerned Scientists to lay the foundation for this work in other parts of the country and then for the state of Rhode Island's Department of Health and their Office of Energy Resources to address mitigation and adaptation in frontline communities there. Most recently, I was a project director for solar projects in frontline communities at Clean Energy Group based in Montpelier, Vermont, where we partnered with community-based organizations and state agencies around the country to advance solar programs by identifying barriers to solar in frontline communities as we uh, worked on replacing polluting peaker power plants with solar and battery storage. Last month, I joined UPROSE as their staff scientist. This is a unique uh, position. A lot of community-based organizations don't have an on-staff scientist, so we're kind of developing this new model for what that means. Uh, as uh, Dr. Um, Benjamin said, UPROSE is Brooklyn's oldest Latino-led community-based organization. Um, and we are currently in the process of conducting a health vulnerability assessment um, focused on climate and COVID-19. The COVID aspect is particularly important to residents in Sunset Park, the community that we serve, as it is a majority community of color, it is a frontline coastal community, and is a working class neighborhood. In New York, 75% of frontline workers are people of color, and 
uh, black and brown people are 4.5 times more likely to be hospitalized uh, for COVID. Sunset Park is also uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19 because of the disproportionate burden of pollution. A recent study from Harvard found that small increases, uh, I believe it was like one microgram per cubic centimeter of PM 2.5, is associated with an 8% increase in COVID-19 death rates. Our survey that we're conducting now uh, include questions about um, access to cooling centers, the ability to keep safe uh, distances from um, sick family members, how COVID is impacting uh, employment, access to health care and needed medication, underlying health conditions in COVID as there are disproportional rates of asthma, diabetes and cardiovascular disease in Sunset Park. And I think with that, I'll end my presentation and we can start our Q&A session. Thank you very, very, very much. Let me, let me start by um, um, asking our panelists, um, so how should um, health departments, but the state or local level, rethink their, their pandemic um, and their disaster planning? Let's talk about disaster planning um, based on um, the things that you've thought about and the things you've told us. Dr. Benjamin, I can address that first. Thank you for that question. Sure. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate at ASU to have really good relationships and a very strong um, uh, public health department in the Maricopa County at the county level. And they're very proactive, actually, in looking at the heat issue. Um, I think it is overwhelming to try to deal with um, such an extreme heat chronic uh, annual perennial um, issue. And then on top of that, have the um, COVID pandemic. Um, I think that one of the things that we found beneficial is that, that they are open to the university uh, relationship. And I think that coming together and working together on the right questions and, and the right research has really helped us identify some of the gaps that were just in our, um, you know, in our awareness of what those vulnerabilities were. For example, they told me that now they are very much paying attention to people in mobile homes. You know, we've really, um, raised awareness of the housing issue and um you know that that kind of relationship has really helped i would say that better data is really the confounding issue that we have you know for privacy issues doing that kind of research together is really a challenge when um you know there's dis when we don't have all that good disaggregated data okay. any other thoughts um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm happy to jump in. Um, when Hurricane Laura was about to make landfall and we weren't sure if it was going to hit between you know, the Houston Galveston area and uh, our neighbors to the east <clears throat> in Louisiana, we were making plans, <clears throat> excuse me, on how to how to house people in shelters and, and you, you really can't do it efficiently. So instead, the health department was renting out rooms in, in hotels to temporarily uh, place folks who are in these low-lying areas. So, I mean, that was, that's a very expensive um, solution to a problem that's going to happen over and over again. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And I guess the challenge is, um, you know, obviously they're not getting those rooms at the rack rate. Right, um, because the hotels are, are challenged with getting um, customers right now. Um, but that may very well be where we are. We may have to build those into our response capacity. Um, and that also means that when you're having to deal with these dual epidemics, that we then have to build in the infection control measures uh, as part of those responses as well. Let's, let's talk about the environmental impact of trash. So we know that we're using a lot more um, stuff with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're doing a lot more disposables. Um, we, we're obviously making a lot more masks. Some of them are, of course, you can clean, but a lot of them are getting thrown out. Um, what are the, what's the environmental impact on that um, as, as we go through these kinds of things? And are we creating another environmental disaster with all the trash that we have. Thoughts? Okay. 
Yes. So I spent 10 years working as an environmental investigator for the state of Texas and walking many landfills that were permitted by the state, as well as illegal dumps that were not permitted by the state. Um, and I happen to have a, a disposable mask right here. Um, and I, I tell you, and I've got a reusable one here, and these are hot to wear in the summer in Houston. Whereas if you're working outside, we have recommended for heat exhaustion <laughs> um, to wear these disposable masks and to throw them away at the end of the day. So if you're a construction worker, <clears throat> working around other um, construction workers, especially indoors in an un air conditioned uh, setting, for example, building a house, remodeling a house after a flood, um, we have been recommending these. Um, uh, it, and the, the environmental impact, I mean, this, this takes some effort in pulling together resources to, to create this. And an N95, again, I'm a safety person, so I haven't had respirators all the time. This is an N95 respirator. Um, so the resources to create this um, are quite substantial. And these really ought to be um, uh, reserved for healthcare providers who really are, are on the front lines and treating folks. <clears throat> but, but the environmental impact of even just creating these, much less disposing of these items, it is something that we're gonna deal with for a generation. Let's, let's, one of the changes that happens with um, disasters is the interruption of the supply lines. Um, any thoughts about um, what we, anything we need to do differently, particularly in, in communities of color and lower resource communities around, around supplies? And I'm thinking about everything from bottled water to face masks to food to, um, you know, does any of that change? Um, first in, in a more severe climate event. And then two, when it's, com when it's um, complicated by an infectious disease like we have with COVID. Any thoughts about that? Well, I think that there could be um, some opportunities. Uh, Sunset Park is an industrial waterfront community. And so a lot of the local businesses were able to pivot to create PPE material and it benefited the local community as well as the greater area. Um, so I think that even in situations like these, there's ways that we can um, think about how frontline communities can participate in the solution and create resilience uh, locally. Okay. Dr. Solius, you have any thoughts? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think I go back again to the um, kind of social and organizational cohesion. You know, a disaster is not the time to start making relationships and starting something new, uh, you know, trying to find people and find communities. Working with the faith-based communities, working with uh, local neighborhood organizations, we have a very close relationship with our Valley the Sun United Way, the Salvation Army, for example, um, that were, you know, uh, the Knowledge Exchange for Resilience was actually put in place only two years ago, but we already had a head start in trying to be responsive. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't have a long ways to go, but those, those early existing relationships were really what, you know, Judith Roden calls the resilience dividend that we activated in these particular moments. And ASU is, um, you know, also lots of local organizations and, and lots of people trying to, uh, you know, create, you know, pivot their operations and trying to create PPE. And ASU put together, it was the Luminosity Lab, they put together a response network to try to match make kind of like an Uber, I guess, um, to try to get the people who were creating it to the people who needed it. So I think it, none of those things would be possible without the kinds of collaborations that are already in place. I, I really like that term, resilience dividend. I, I wrote it down. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful term. Uh, and I, I would add to that that resilience comes from being prepared. We, we more or less know what the disasters <clears throat> are gonna impact, whether it's fires in the, in the West Coast or hurricanes along the Gulf Coast and, the, you know, we, we more or less know what's going to happen. So being prepared for that really does <clears throat> increase resilience. Um, it, it did in my case. Thank you. Yeah, you know, Dr. Rios, you, you, you pointed out the, the three stories that you told quite eloquently. Um, and, and in essence, um, for me, it raises the, the question about resilience and what does resilience mean? 
Um, I've always kind of thought about the goal of resilience is the, the ability to bring a community back as quickly to near normal as possible. Um, and you raised some very important questions about how do we measure that? Um, and what do we do, do proactively versus retroactively to make sure that happens? Can you expand upon that a little bit? And then I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Solius and, and uh, Ms. Hammer to, to, to add to that. Sure, thank you. So um, in preparing our communities, we have to think about the different communities that blend together and to create this giant whole. So I, I'm a member of the Hispanic community. I'm a member of the university community. I'm a member of this very nice neighborhood, this community here. So the needs in each of these communities are very different from each other. <clears throat> and uh, for <clears throat> Kali, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> with people who are very dependent on the environment for their, their livelihood, uh, the, the fishing vessels off the coast of Galveston or the, the yard people, um, these, these folks are very dependent on the environment um, and the economic, economic impact of severe weather on their livelihood is tremendous. Um, so if one, one solution perhaps is to train these people who are so dependent on the environment to do other things and to do those other things safely um, during time. So the BP oil spill, if we could train uh, fishermen um, in the 40 hour Haswapper course ahead of time so that they can respond to the oil spill um, because they're unable to fish. Um, so if we could prepare them and make them more resilient so that they still have a paycheck coming in. Um, construction workers on how to safely muck and gut, that's what we call it, muck and gut a house that's been flooded. So I think training and education um, are critical to those, uh, to making somebody resilient. Um, and I think I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm a little long-winded on this conference. I just wanted to add to the points you made. Those are great points about training and job opportunities. And I think especially now that we're entering this uh, new opportunity for a green economy and building resilience, that there are a lot of um, uh, opportunities for job creation um, and green industry and training at all different levels of employment within those new industries. And that's something that uh, in Uprose, we're working to position our residents to be able to take advantage of. And we feel that ultimately it does create resilience and it allows uh, the community to continue to be a working class community to fight, uh, to resist to gentrification and to be able to contribute to uh, addressing climate change. Yes, I'd echo that. I actually think that all of us would probably agree that the shock of this health pandemic has really revealed some of the fray at the edges of our society and our, our systems, actually. It's revealed a lot of these inequities and uh, maybe that have been hidden before um, and really how severe they can be, how precarious some of our communities really are to, to some kind of shock and then multiply that by what is already going on with climate change. Um, I think that when I think of resilience, you know, we do have an opportunity to, to respond to that, not just to bounce back to some old normal, but to really transform throughout that process and to try to look for those opportunities uh, where, you know, we're trying to address, for example, in Maricopa County, this housing issue. Um, but, you know, it represents affordable housing. It represents a good opportunity for economic development. We need to invest in these kinds of things to keep people in place and to keep them safe. So, uh, you know, I feel like that there's, you know, two ways to go with this. We can decide to, um, you know, try to return to some kind of normal, or we can really dig deep and, and uh, be brave and try to transform through it. Yeah, thank you for that. I, you know, the, the, one of the challenges that I know that we have is trying to convince um, some public health leaders that climate change is something that they should be engaged in. Um, now, my view of the world is that if it hurts people or kills people, um, public health plays a role. And it's clear that uh, the impact of climate change does that. Um, let me ask all three of you, how do, how do we, um, 
if you if you you know had uh, you know a few minutes in an elevator with a public health official and you were wanted to convince them um, uh, of this in, in, that it's important that their health department be involved um, in this and they provide that leadership, what, what would you do? Let me let me start with um, Dr. Scalia. What would you do? What would you what would you say to them? Your well, elevator speech. <laughs> well, for, fortunately, we do already speak very, very often to our um, public health uh, department. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't matter how far back you dig about climate change and why it's happening and, and, you know, the history of that. What you can see is the impacts right now. And I think focusing in on what is going on right now, cutting to the chase, uh, you know, linking up, we don't even necessarily have to talk about climate change in those explicit terms. Uh, we can see the effects of extreme heat on our population right now. Um, it's kind of the aha, duh moment that you get when you see <laughs> this is something we really need to address anyway. Okay. Others? Well, like Dr. Uh, Solis said, um, we're also um, working closely with uh, local health agencies. But I'd like to just kind of point out, you know, those flooding pictures that I showed, that happens about a dozen times a year in Miami right now and in other places as well. But by the year 2045, the US Army Corps projections, which are very conservative sea level rise projections, anticipate those events happening upwards of 350 times per year. So as bad as we think the situations are with flooding, with storms, with wildfires, the reality is that we're just at the beginning of sea the impacts of climate change that are baked into the system and so we need to focus on building resiliency now in all aspects of our, of, of our communities uh, when it comes to employment affordable housing resilience um, this is the window that we have to prepare and to mitigate the very worst and so I think that that's a, that's kind of the sense of urgency that that we feel in our organization and that a lot of our partners including uh, healthcare experts are feeling as well I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think what I would say to decision makers is really consider the decisions. What, get a, a wide variety of opinions from, from experts, real experts, not you know, bloggers, but people who really are scientists and people who um, understand the environment, understand science, understand that um, the scientific method even, because I don't think everybody understands the scientific method. And that's okay, it doesn't make them bad. Um, it just is, um, what opinions do we want to consider as we make decisions moving forward? And then what are the positive and negative consequences of those decisions? Because um, the unintended consequences uh, always happen, um, good, or bad or otherwise. Um, so I, I would really think about gathering the data, as Dr. Solis says, um, making sure that we are considering a variety of opinions and then making um, solid evidence-based decisions um, and, and being a little bit flexible along the way it, to address those um, unintended consequences. Dr. Benjamin, I would add, I, I really love the way, Nicole, that you said that um, and, and Janelle as well. I feel like you know, we need to take that beyond just the public sector. I feel like we need to get the private sector involved in that solutions uh, development, right? Um, the insurance companies, the utility companies, of course, that's a, you know, a public service. But I feel like if we don't make it a whole society effort, um, our, our initiatives are, are just not going to take hold and be at the level that the response requires. Well, you know, um, the question is, how do we uh, bounce back better? Um, and how do we do that in a way that, um, I mean, if, can each of you kind of give us some real world examples of, um, of how people can do that from an equity and justice perspective, um, recognizing that it's not just about um, the, the, um, the mechanics of, of, of this as much as in many ways is how can the average citizen um, you know, really do this? You know, how do they, um, how can they reduce their carbon footprint, for example, um, individually? People keep saying it's costly to do that, but maybe not so much. Any thoughts? 
it's costly not to do that. Um, and, and I think that we forget about what the costs are in the future with you know, a flood. That's very expensive. It's very expensive. Um, so maybe having more electric cars on the road and to do that, maybe getting not um, some policy decisions by policymakers to, to provide a break, some sort of tax incentive to purchase an electric car versus a, a gasoline powered vehicle. You, you, you know, so it's getting those elected officials involved um, as well as, you know, Patricia has these great uh, relationships with the health department and Nicole does too, and, and we do too here locally um, to make sure that the, the new research and the new findings um, are communicated effectively to the health department and then to elected officials through testimony at commissioner's court, for example. Um, so I, I, I really do think that education is, is critical to this endeavor. Others? Well, I, um, I waffle back and forth all the time on a daily basis between being an optimist and a pessimist on this kind of a question. Uh, you know, just dealing with um, the already um, extreme heat housing effects of uh, mobile homes, dwellers, and um, some of the experiences that we've had with our study participants. Uh, you know, it just uh, helps us think through how we want to keep our communities in place, right? Um, during the shelter, uh, shelter in place orders, um, we were able to raise enough awareness that the city of Mesa sent out their fire department this last summer during the really hot, you know, I don't know how many consecutive days of over 115 that we had uh, to about 20 mobile home parks that reached about 80, 8,000 people, excuse me, eight to 10,000 people probably. And they normally would not have done that. Um, it of course also involved the private owners of those parks for giving permission uh, for uh, entry into those spaces. So I, I, I'm optimistic about that, but then yet I see these numbers where um, we're already 50% uh, higher uh, heat related deaths suspected that need to be confirmed this year. We're not even done with this year. September also sees high numbers and um, our record was 200. We're in for a shock after October 31st when the state moratorium on evictions is lifted. Um, and also the utility moratorium is lifted and those bills come due. Um, we're using as much data as possible to try to get ahead of that and try to advise. And some of our machine learning algorithms are spitting out that we might see, you know, double the number of evictions, which are, which are already 60,000 per year in Maricopa County. And what's going to be the impact of that? Um, so I really can't say that I feel completely optimistic about our ability to do that. All I know is that we have to keep digging down in the data, digging down in those relationships, like we've been saying, um, keep that urgent view ahead of us and um, hopefully draw on those resilience dividends. Um, so it's, it's a tough question, or it's a tough ask of frontline communities to reduce their carbon footprints because low-income communities and communities of color are the least uh, of the contributors of climate change, both in, in the U.S., in the U.S. South, and in the global South. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're a poll after poll of Latino communities um, shows uh, that we are on board with uh, climate change mitigation, that we are concerned about climate change, and that we want action. Um, so I think that the biggest thing, hours before the first presidential debate, is voting. Um, second to that uh, is talking about resilience and adaptation because our communities know about resilience. Immigrant communities know about resilience. And the solutions should start there. 
you know, the work that we're doing when we're putting together a grant or we're putting together a research plan, it starts with community discussions. A lot of times researchers come in with already kind of the idea of what it is that they want to do in your community and what they need you to do. And sometimes you don't show up on the budget. <laughs> and, and that really needs to change. <laughs> things, things need to turn around. And those conversations, because there's a wealth of, of knowledge and experience and resources that need to be brought to bear, especially now and especially in the framework of a just transition to a resilient and green economy. Let me, let me ask, um, um, you know, I know that as I've watched the COVID um, outbreak roll out and, and, and I mentioned in my presentation about misinformation and disinformation, misinformation being the the uh, inaccurate information that um, that one can can inadvertently pass around from one person to another, um, and disinformation being the purposeful passing around of misinformation and disinformation. Um, any sense of the role of of, um, um, of of the wrong information being passed around within um, more vulnerable communities? I mean, what do what do you what are more vulnerable communities hearing? Um, and then let's talk a little bit about in the context of what they're hearing that's not correct, um, how we might, you know, how we might fix that. I think that's a really interesting point. And I think one of the reasons that uh, Latinos in the U.S. are more likely to understand issues around climate change and accept that that's what's happening and, and, um, and believe the science on that is because we get our news from an international platform like Telemundo and Univision. So we're not as susceptible to kind of the disinformation that's in a lot of the US focused uh, media, unfortunately. So um, I, I think that that's one uh, good aspect of the way that information uh, exists um, when it comes to climate change in frontline communities and spe specifically Latino communities. On the other side, it's, there's such a lag between the information that we know about the impact of pollution on health and about what can be done in a household and how that information gets to the folks that need it the most. And that's, and that's really, uh, really a frustrating thing. And I think there needs to be more active outreach on the part of researchers with information about dealing with pollution uh, in frontline communities um, in a way that is usable by, by, by folks, by everyday folks. What Nicole has said is just so profound. And I, I would only just add to that, that I share with you this, this uh, perspective that not only do we need to pay attention to what they are hearing, but hearing from them. I feel like, you know, after um, the events of this last summer and the murder of George Floyd, there has been a, you know, a, moment for commitment to listening uh, to voices that have really been marginalized for quite some time and calls for social justice. I think we need to continue to take that seriously and not make it just a one moment um, kind of response. Uh, you know, the convergence of that uh, event, these uh, climate change events, the extreme weather and the extreme heat that we've had this summer, and then the pandemic all together, if that doesn't wake us up to say we really need to be listening more, um, then I think that uh, we're going to miss a really important opportunity. Dr. Salias, let me ask you a question about, um, um, in your presentation, you were talking about um, um, you know, the heat and heat related deaths and COVID. Is there, have you yet seen any correlation between the COVID cases and, and, and heat injury? Unfortunately, like I mentioned before, we can't get disaggregated data. It's a really a challenge to try to devise a way to look at those kinds of statistics and be very robust about them if you don't have disaggregated data. Um, so unfortunately, we're not able to, you know, make that connection directly. Um, you know, there's ways that you can try to do that agent-based modeling. We have some um, people on our team that are looking at that and trying to use machine learning for the evictions modeling. The one thing I can say is that I compared county by county 
um, where are the places that are experiencing both high number of heat related deaths and high number of COVID related deaths. And there are two counties that stick out, uh, you know, among those, and that is in Yuma and in Santa Cruz. So there, there does seem to be, you know, some communities that we can pinpoint that are exceptionally vulnerable. We're seeing that impact. Thank you very much. Well, I think we're getting close to the end of our, our panel. Um, with that, let me just personally thank um, Dr. Salias, Dr. Rios, um, Ms. Ha um, Ms. Hammer for their, for their very insightful thoughts. And I will turn it back on to, um, that goes to Dr. Walvis, John. Great, thank you so much, Georges. And let me just echo, first of all, thanks to you for the wonderful presentation and the wonderful moderation of, of our seminar today. And also huge thanks to Janelle and, and to um, Patricia and, and, and Nicole for, for their um, wonderful comments as panelists. I think we've had a great discussion trying to weave these narratives together. It's always a little bit challenging to talk about climate change in a long-term thing and the COVID pandemic and the disasters, so local and so focus um, with the equity lens, but, but you have done a really wonderful job. Um, again, a huge thank you to all who are still with us uh, on, the, on the seminar. Um, thank you for your participation today. We hope this has been uh, valuable and, and interesting to you all. It is always impossible to answer all the questions and we will do the best to capture the questions um, that have not been answered and to share them with the panelists. And um, we will also be sharing contact info if anybody would like to, and there it is. Thank you very much, Tricia. Um, <laughs> if anybody would like to uh, follow up their questions directly with, with any of the speakers. Um, with that, um, just a reminder again, October 21st at, um, at 1 p.m. will be our next in our seminar series. This will focus on climate change and children's health and NSAO, but Witherspoon of the Children's Environmental Health Network will be our guest moderator. Um, so please join us. And um, with that, I will uh, give a huge thanks to, to um, to, to Nathan Michener and, and the staff uh, who have provided the closed captioning and, and the support today. And uh, a huge thank you to Tricia Castranio, the program manager of our Global Environmental Health Program who has been our host. And I'll turn it back to you, Tricia, to close. Well, thanks, John. I think you hit all my highlights. So <laughs> I wanted to- They're worth uh, repeating. <laughs> right, yeah. thanks to our speakers. I thought you guys did a great job. A big, uh, a big applause for you. Uh, thanks to Nathan for having us over and letting us bring all of our friends. It was, it was great to hang out with you. And um, we appreciate the um, captioning that was, that was going on live for us too as well. And uh, yeah, uh, please send any feedback that you have either to me or to John. We, we'd love to hear from you. And um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. There's our October event. And I think I had one more. Yeah. The recordings will be archived at this, at this link here. You're welcome to go there. And uh, in a week, probably the, this uh, webinar will be posted there.